Good evening, everybody. It's so nice to have you here. Um, I'm Austin. If you haven't been here, I'm the um, owner with my partner, Bob, of Jiva Mukti Yoga, Jersey City. And we were just talking with Dev Dutt Panayak, and we were just talking about how that this is the second time he's come here this year. It's very, very wonderful to have him here twice in a year. And he's been on tour for 18 days. <laughs> How many cities? Eight cities. Eight cities, <laughs> and um, we are the last city on his tour, so that's very auspicious. <laughs> like, this is like a, a very auspicious day. Um, today, the, the uh, topic is going to be the stories of the Hindu gods and the goddesses equal the fruit of the Vedic tree. Um, for Westerners like myself, the first time we're introduced to Vedic tradition is, is when we start to practice yoga. And if we pick a style of yoga that has a lineage that goes back, our, my tradition goes all the way back to Krishnamacharya. And I didn't start practicing asana until I was 42 years old. And the first time I was introduced to Vedic concepts was at Jiva Mukti teacher training. And it was the teachings of my teacher's teacher, Sri Brahmananda Saraswati, who was the creator of the Vandantic Society of New York City and the founder of Ananda Ashram in Monroe, New York. Um, for somebody who was stepping into it cold, the Vedic tradition was, it was way over my head intellectually in the beginning. I would read things and I would just think, what, am, what is this, what am I trying to figure out here? Um, and it wasn't until I started reading Devdutt's books that I started to understand that these stories that are told through mythology are really for people like myself. It's explaining the Vedic ideas and concepts to everyday people. It's breaking it down. And so here to tell us more about that and how it all works is Dev Dutt. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, these pictures are here because la last time we sort of illustrated some of the things um, and I decided so today is Vijaya Dashami, it's a very important day and if you are in India, you are worshipping the goddess, it's the final night of the worshipping of the goddess and um, the goddess is worshipped twice a year, once in spring and once in autumn. This is Indian spring and Indian autumn. The Indian spring comes before the rainy season. The four, India is controlled by these four months of the rainy season. It's called the monsoons. And uh, why don't you come here? There's a lot of place here. So um, there's the monsoons for four months. And just before the monsoons, there's summer. And before summer, there's spring. So that is called the Vasanta Navratri, nine nights over which the goddess is worshipped. And the second time, it is in autumn, which is Sharad. And just after the rains, and the, it's beautiful, and for nine nights, the goddess is worshipped again. So the goddess is worshipped twice over the nine nights. And it's very funny, though, because uh, how it's celebrated in different parts of India gives you an indication of how diverse the country is. So if you're in North India, um, if you go towards the Punjab, these are the ninth nights when everybody over there who loves their whiskey and who loves their chicken tikka masala will say, oh, for these nine nights, we are going to be vegetarian. We're not going to touch alcohol because it's the days of the goddess. But if you come to where I come from, I come from the eastern part of India. My parents came from there. Or you go to Bengal or you go to Assam. These are the nine nights where you're only going to eat mutton. And you're only going to eat eggs. And you're going to eat, drink whiskey. And you're like, okay, so what's the right Hinduism? The northern version, which is vegetarian for the goddess, or the eastern version, and they have not even come to the western version and the southern version. And it's not so simple. In the same village, there would be people who'd be vegetarian on these nine nights, and another person who'd be non-vegetarian. And you're like, how does, does one explain this? Because the goddess worship is associated with... Uh, animal sacrifice and blood and alcohol and these were taboo subjects for uh, someone who would be following the Brahmin traditions who would say I will not touch alcohol, 
I will never touch non-vegetarian food. I will stay away from these things. So on one side, you have a tradition which says, I will stay away from non-vegetarian food and alcohol. On the other side, you have a tradition which celebrates alcohol and non-vegetarian food. The goddess is thirsty, they will say, and she has to be fed blood. And these are, and they come from different social strata, different social structures. So the people who would be farming communities, laborers, tribes, they would say that the goddess needs blood. The elite priests who speak in Sanskrit, who follow rules of purity, will say, no, 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 we have to stay away from these things. These are pollutants. And if you understand these two extremes, you start understanding the diversity of the country. It's not just geographical diversity. It is also historical diversity. Ideas have changed over time. They come and go, come and go. And then there is the diversity of communities. In the same village, in a historical period, in a geography, different people in the same village will be following different practice for the same festival. And therefore, to understand Indian traditions, one, the word diversity is very critical. There is no one way. In fact, if you try to make it one way, you, you miss the point. If I were to do, I can see a lot of Indians in the audience. If I were to make a sort of a, do a workshop and find out from them what do they think, how the ritual has to be followed, everybody will come up with a different version. And all of them are valid. And that is the magic of the system. Somewhere along the line, we are trying to homogenize it. It doesn't work like that, it's heterogeneous. And any heterogeneous system in the world, whenever there is heterogeneity in a system, there are bound to be tensions. Somebody has more, somebody has less. Anybody who's a student of physics will explain to you, a heterogeneous system come like gravity, like a large planet and a small planet, they have different gravitational energies. They will attract each other, they will repel each other, because heterogeneity clears this. Therefore, you cannot use words, when you, people start using words like equality, it won't work in India, because equality doesn't understand heterogeneity and diversity. Heterogeneity and diversity is one way of thinking, and these, all these ideas around the world, if you now look at the global village and step back, the global village is very much like India, diverse. You know, if you study Islam long enough, you'll realize there's no one Islam. There's the Shia system, there's the Sunni system, there's the Arabic version, there's the Persian system. In Africa, it is practiced differently. In Indonesia, it is practiced differently. Same thing with Christianity. There's Catholicism, there is Protestant tradition, the Lutheran tradition. America has so many schools of thought. Diversity and equality will always be at tensions with each other. And this is something one has to understand. And I think it's a great day today to discuss these two polarizing principles which also nourish each other. So at one level, they are the opposites of each other. At one level, they connect with each other. So what we'll do now is we will um, try to understand the goddess. Today, we'll focus with the goddess because it is the festival of the goddess. It makes sense to begin with the goddess. Okay, if you, uh, many of you all are sitting, bravely sitting without back rib support. Yeah, so after half an hour, many of you all are gonna face problems unless you have joined this Yoga Mukti Ji Yoga Center and we're doing a lot of yoga. Yeah, so just feel free to move about a little bit, stand up, it's fine, I don't get offended, yeah? yeah. So, um, so just, just, just relax yourselves because it will be tough on your back. So we will begin with, uh, you know, uh, the story of the goddess. If you go to the, ten imagine you go to a, Durga Pandal, a Bengali side, that's the eastern side of India. You will go to the temple, uh, or you'll go to a Pandal, and these images, these images, I, I don't know if all of you all can see, but I will put, put it up later, and then maybe we can do something about it. So, you know yeah? Yeah, so once I do this, then I'll tear it and keep it there, but we'll do many gods today. So many fruits, yeah? So one god for this side, and one god for that side. Yeah, so, um, so the goddess, what is interesting is, if you look at the central part of the image, she looks like a princess. She has got jewelry, she is beautiful, you know, she has these. And she has 
lots of jewelry, like a bride. She has a nose ring. She has got earrings. She has got, she's like really gorgeous. So you see a bride. And then you move from the center and you look on the side, you start realizing, hey, this is no princess. You know, like she has many arms. So there are many arms and she is, so she is not a princess, she's a goddess. You know, imagine you go to a temple and you see many statues, how do you know it's a goddess? Not a god. Either they'll have many hands or they'll have many heads because they're not like other human beings. Otherwise, how will I know the difference between human and superhuman? So you have, the simple code is many hands, many heads. So a child says, oh, that's a goddess. Many hands, all of them holding weapons. So suddenly, the bride is holding weapons. And not just holding weapons, she's actually using them. <laughs> so she's got this trident, and she, the trident, she is killing this buffalo, who she's holding by the tail and brutally impaling it. There it is, being killed by the buffalo. So this is the image. And to her will be offered blood sacrifices. So, we can look at these later. So the image is, so it's at one level a very gentle, beautiful bride, looks so pretty. Then she has weapons. What is she doing with the weapon? She's killing a buffalo. And the child is being taken to show this image. And you see this image of beauty and violence simultaneous. So it's beautiful at one level, it's alluring, it's attractive, it evokes a different energy. You're drawn to it, so pretty. And then you see violence at the same time, not just ordinary violence, this is brutal violence. She's cutting him and blood is spurting over there. And you realize she is with a lion who is pouncing on this buffalo. And, there, and this from the bu buffalo's body, a demon is appearing and she's catching hold of his head and chopping off his neck. And you're like, oh, not a gentle princess. <laughs> yeah, and that's the image. So you do darshan, you look at this image. And the image looks back at you. And you look carefully and you realize the face has no tension, the way the artist will do it. There is no tension. It's very calm and composed. It's like, you're like, hey, why is it so? It's not feeling anger. There's no anger. There's no rage. There is this kind of a, the same face would be there if she was dancing. And you're like, what are they showing? Is this a violent image? And they'll say, yes, it is a violent image. Is it a? erotic image because she is dressed in this bridal finery. Why would you dress up with so much jewelry? Not for fun, but to make yourself alluring and attractive and say, yeah, it's also a sexual image. And sex and violence simultaneously. And you're like, and then they're saying, if you go to the Bengal Pandals, there are two gods on either side and there are two goddesses and they say, oh, these are her children. And she's coming, and the, when the festival uh, starts, the women will start to sing songs welcoming her, saying that the daughter has come to the father's house after her marriage. And for those, it's Ashtami was yesterday, they will perform these celebrations where they'll feed her. And all the women will come and sing and dance around her. They'll cry with her and they'll enjoy. The bride has come to her house because she got married and married someone, and for days she's coming back, and they're all hugging the sister, they're connecting with her, because you see traditionally in traditional Indian families, the woman, in, especially in rural India, say 100 years ago, a woman would get married, and perhaps never come back to her parents' home, because the villages were so far away. And if you did come back during, when you were pregnant, you would come back when you were, because you want to deliver the child in your mother's house, because your mother would take good care of you. 
because in the in the husband's house you have to take care of that house nobody's there to take care of you but when you come to your mother's house somebody takes care of you so this ritual image which is at once sexual and violent is also part of a ritual so this is a symbol you can see it but the ritual is for the women the daughter has come back home so feed her because she's grown so thin husband doesn't take care of her parents and not don't treat her well let's treat her well so there is these festivals have this very emotional element about it you feed her and the women will dance and sing with her there are the celebrations called like in the gujarat side in the western side of india there's garba which comes from the word garb garb is the womb which is represented by a pot and inside the pot there are sprouts and the women will dance around only women men won't dance around this that's the different dance only women will dance and they will hit their hands and they'll bend down to look at the earth because she is the goddess who is and suddenly you realize the goddess is being associated with the earth and this coming home festival it's something like a thanksgiving day when the family gathers together or a christmas when people come together but here it is the girl in the center of the woman is at the center so suddenly the violent image is all forgotten nobody's noticing it they're just saying oh the girl has come home and they were celebrating her and this is this great ritual and then people will tell her story so you've got the symbol you've got a ritual and then you have a story and the story will be once upon a time and this is how all the stories start once upon a time the gods were living in swarga swarga is paradise and they had everything that they desired the wish fulfilling tree the wish fulfilling cow the wish fulfilling jewel they were happy until the asuras attacked them and the asuras attacked them and why did the asuras attack because you are having all the fun we don't have anything we want what you have so the asuras attack the devas and the devas don't know how to defeat the asuras so they go to the gods and say go to their father brahma and say help us help us and brahma says listen you are my children the devas are my children so the gods here look is really the word is deva not gods but devas are my children but the asuras are also my children both are my children you're fighting with each other but you know they're both my children i can't really favor one over the other let's go to someone else who'll decide so they go to vishnu and vishnu says okay fine the asuras are fighting i can def- but i can't defeat them he this particular asura this one is too strong i can't defeat him let's go to shiva so they go to shiva another god he's an ascetic he sits on the mountain he lives like a mendicant and they go to him and say can you help us out and he says well that asura should be killed he's creating too much trouble but i can't do it can only be killed because you see he's so strong that he can't be killed by a human or an animal or a plant or a god can only be killed by a woman so we need the help of a woman and the gods look around and realize they're all men there's no woman so no diversity policy there and then they say okay what do we do so shiva says channel your inner woman literally inside every one of you is shakti the goddess sitting inside you let her come out of your body so all the gods release the inner woman and she comes out like a like a tongue of a flame of tongue of fire like flame so from indra the king of the gods who is the ruler of the sky comes indrani this she comes out and from agni something else comes out and from the wind god something comes out and from the varuna something comes out and all the gods are standing in this great circle and from within them this fire is coming out it is great and the, all the fires come together and burst into a larger fire from vishnu something comes out from all the gods all the fire comes out and it becomes this great fire and from within this blazing fire comes out this beautiful grand woman with many hands gorgeous looking it is the combination of the feminine principle in all the gods and they look at her and they are spellbound and she says you want me to fight give me weapons 
So all the gods give her one weapon each. So all the weapons she's carrying are the weapons of the gods. And it's very interesting. The gods meant are present over there. Some of them belong to the Vedic tradition, books written 4,000 years ago. And books is not a right word, but hymns that were composed 4,000 years ago. These Indra, and there is Surya, and there's Agni. These are Vedic gods, 4,000 years old, and they are power. And some of the other gods are the Puranic gods. These are characters who emerge later, so are roughly around 2,000 years ago. Shiva becomes important, Vishnu becomes important, all of them this story comes to us about 1500 years ago. It's a later story, but she's taking the power of all the gods who came before her. So all the gods who existed before me, I shall take all their power, and I'll become greater than the sum total of them together. So the inner woman, Shakti, comes out, and she's called Durga. And Durga is a very interesting word, because Durga, the word Durg means a fortress, that with which you protect yourself. So she's the embodiment of the fortress. She is that which will protect the gods. And she comes and goes out riding a lion. And why is it interesting, a lion? Because lion is the symbol of sovereignty, of kingship, the ultimate alpha predator. So she's riding the alpha predator with the weapons of the old gods. Do you see a feminist discourse here? <laughs> and this is 1500 years old. This is the narrative which is from the Devi Bhagavatam. Of course, there are many versions of the story, but broadly, this is the story. From the gods, they release the inner Shakti, who takes a female form, and this is radical. The use of the female until then was always on the side. They were always in the supportive, complementary roles. This is the first time she is the protagonist of the story. She rides the lion, she goes into battle, catches hold of the demon, and kills him. In fact, he looks at her and says, oh, you pretty one, you really want to fight? He's very patronizing. And she's like, yeah, yeah, come. And it's a brutal war, and she's like, they say that she's playing bells at the same time, because she's having a great time. She's not angry and upset. She's like, I'm gonna, this is a fly, I shall swat him. <laughs> but it is done with such grace and gentleness, and then she looks at him, and then he's like, oh my god, I'm so sorry. And like all these stories of violence, there is forgiveness. And he's like, it's okay. You didn't know how strong I was. Because how does a strong person deal with a weak person? Because a weak person always brags. A strong person shows. And that's what she does. So this, that, that goddess is not angry with him. She's like, oh God, he doesn't know it. He's a child. It's the same expression that mothers have when they're trying to feed their children. Do your homework. And you're angry. But that's not real anger. It's play acting. The Sanskrit word for play acting is leela. You're play acting to get the child to do what you want to do your homework. And so you play act to get them to eat spinach. You want them to do the homework. You want to go to do exercise. Because you know more. And we all do that with people. We have to play act to indulge their little fantasies about how powerful they are. And in many ways, the stories of this powerful woman who's managing the world. And she becomes, her image starts to appear around this time across India. Before that, you don't find these images. You suddenly find these grand images of this goddess, and she becomes the patron of kings. So there are these macho men whose patron is this goddess. On the t if they build a fortress, on the gate of the fortress will be the goddess with multiple hands, killing the buffalo demon. And these images are found proliferating everywhere. Where did she come from? 2,000 years ago, there's not much mention of her. There is like somewhere here and there, but where does she come from? And people, when they do research, they figure out that this was the goddess of the tribal people and of the local indigenous peoples and the people who worked on the soil, who did work, manual, they were not the people sitting far away in sophisticated spaces later. And this is what is happening. So you have these stories emerging 
and you ask these stories and you're saying, what is this? Now you look at these stories, what are they trying to communicate? Why, what, what is all this all about? Because there's so many layers to it, right? There's historical layers happening. There are geographical layers, anthropological layers, gender issues, all this, this is coalescing itself. But at the, far, at the base of it is the idea of the feminine taking center stage. And the feminine in Indian traditions represents, at a, it's a metaphor for the world. The two metaphors that are to be used, the masculine metaphor and the feminine metaphor. I'm using the word metaphor very deliberately because it makes then sense. The feminine metaphor is used for all things material, all things that make up nature. So your body is seen as the feminine. The masculine metaphor is used for the mind, for the emotions, for the thought, all the things that you cannot measure, that is not tangible. So our mind is masculine, our body is feminine. That's how they bring it together. And to, for this body to survive, in order for the body to survive, this body has to eat. You have to eat things. And every time you have to eat something, something in the world has to die. Something has to be consumed. So plants consume sunlight, water, nutrients. Animals consume plants or other animals. So this continuous cycle of consumption which sustains this body of ours. So if you want to build a field, I say, hey, I want a field, I want to grow rice. The first thing you do is you clear the forest. You destroy the ecosystem so that you can tame and cultivate the land which you call your own. So in the, in the Mahabharata, when the Pandavas say, we want to build a city, the first thing Krishna says is, set the forest aflame. So you are aware that your city is built on destruction. And therefore, there is great violence. You don't have to do it. You say, I don't want to do it. I don't want to be violent. Great. Then don't aspire for a city. Then don't feed. Don't bother to eat. So the great ascetics of India would not eat. They would fast. That's how the fasting tradition began, to remind people that every act of eating involves something dying. So the act of eating, bhog, demands bali, which is sacrifice. So the plant has to be eaten for the cow to survive. The deer is eaten so that the tiger survives. So violence is an essential ingredient in the natural, physical, mortal cycle. My body has to survive, I have to eat. To eat, what do I eat? And that becomes important, what do I eat? And therefore this great thing about violence is acknowledged by the tribes, because they were living under earth. They realize that, you know, unless some, a tree is cut, I can't build my house. Or I have to live in like a hermit in a cave. Or I have to dam the river and build canals. And when I build a canal, I destroy the river's ecosystem. But I have to in order to build my farm for industry. So violence is inherent in culture. So there is no escaping. The only truly nonviolent is the sage who doesn't eat. In fact, the Jain sages would only eat fruit which dropped from a tree. They would not even pluck fruit from a tree. Because how far can you go not eating? Because your body demands nourishment. And therefore, violence. So she's close to violence. And suddenly you realize the goddess is always described as drinking blood. In her images, many of her images, one of her very famous images of the goddess, which start appearing around this time, is called Chinnamastika, the one with a cut head. So the image is very interesting. It is the goddess who has severed her own neck. So she has a knife and she cuts her own head off. And on the other hand, 
is her own head and the blood which is spurting off her body she's drinking it herself so the severed head is drinking the blood which is spurting out I eat myself, I nourish myself, I kill myself. This is the metaphor for nature. I don't know if you've seen this mystical symbol, it's called the self-eating serpent. Have you ever seen this image? It's called a serpent which is eating its own tail. And people don't know whether, she, is it eating its own tail or is it giving birth to its own tail? The image is designed such way that you don't know whether it's eating its own tail or it is giving birth to its own tail. So death and life are together. In this picture, is it death or life? Chinna mastika, is it death at one level, which is cutting her head off, right? But it's also nourishing something. And they're trying to communicate this idea using visual forms of life. Nature is eating itself. And the image is always sitting on a couple which is making love. So it's a sexual image. Why? Because no matter how much you eat, one day you're going to die. No matter how much you eat, one day all of us are going to die. So how do we stay alive? How do we outwit death? Through reproduction. That's how you outwit death. Physically. And therefore, all animals and plants are producing, why do the plants produce flowers? Not because they like you and they want to be in your drawing room. But it's because they're reproducing. They're reproducing themselves. You know, the, my friend said that if you want plants to give birth to, I mean, give flower, you just don't give them water for a couple of days. The plant gets so, it panics because it's not getting water and it bursts into flowers. Its survival instinct takes over because it feels, oh, I'm not getting food, I'll die. I better produce myself. Animals, therefore, reproduce. There is a reproduction cycle happen. So sex and violence is integral. Sex and violence is integral. So here you have Chinna Mastika. The one who drinks the blood from her own severed neck. Or you have this, this of course a global symbol, it's not very much part of India. I've seen it in one or two places, but you find this in other mystical cultures also. This the self-eating serpent. And you don't know whether it's about life or death. And then you realize nature is about life and death. Life and sex and violence. And sex at one level creates near life and protects you from death. Violence is death, of course, but it is also saving lives. And then you suddenly look at the Durga image. There you can see sex and violence simultaneously, and you realize, oh, it's the goddess, it's nature. They're talking about nature. The goddess has come with full force. Let me explain what I mean by nature. Why is nature suddenly so important? The image over there, I showed you this, is a sexual image over there. She's sitting on a love-making couple. But what's significant over there is that the woman is always top of, on top of the man. Why is this? These are tantric images. These are images that people don't want to talk about. Oh my God, we can't talk about these things. Just like alcohol, which is mother, or sex, maithuna, mamsa, meat. These are all taboo topics in India. Because they're necessary. They, the two schools of thought will separate each other. One, the school of thought which wouldn't eat the meat wouldn't drink the alcohol, would also celebrate celibacy. No sex is wisdom. So you see this in the Buddha story, right? Buddha withdraws himself from family life. He says, I don't want to get married, I don't want children. His, he leaves his wife, he leaves his newborn child, he leaves his kingdom, and he goes to the forest, and in the forest he becomes the ascetic, the, as, the hermit who will not eat if possible, has to eat, will eat vegetarian food very less, will not touch alcohol, will not have sexual relations. That's one Buddha. But if you start reading the history of Buddhism, over 1500 years, you see a shift. Suddenly, Buddha's images are associated with the woman. The goddess Tara appears. 
even Buddha stops being this stiff body type. His images show him like a dancer. He stands, his body is undulating, he's very feminine in his stance. He's holding a, he's shown holding a lotus flower. It's called Padmapani. So he becomes feminine. He's associated with the feminine. The goddess starts to appear in Buddhist narratives. And when you read the tantric Buddhist traditions from Tibet, you will see the goddess sitting on top of him. Why this? Because it shows volition. This is the way of showing nature taking control. This is not, I'm not compelled to do it. I'm forcing you to do it. The woman takes charge. The woman taking charge. Or nature taking charge. It depends on which language you want to use. Am I talking about woman? Am I talking about nature? The scriptures won't clarify. And then they are saying that your mind which is withdrawing from the world, this masculine mind saying, I don't want to be part of this world. I don't want to be part of this world. I don't want to be part of this world. As you're withdrawing and withdrawing and withdrawing and withdrawing from the world, you have to deal with so many demons. And it's difficult to deal with the demons. Sometimes you have to go back to nature. You have to deal with the world. You have to deal with the goddess. And so you have to come out of the cave and participate in the world. So Buddha, who is withdrawn from the world, becomes bodhisattva, the compassionate one. Observe how compassion is associated with the feminine principle. Wisdom is associated with the masculine principle. Wisdom can be isolated. On my own, I'll be wise, wise, wise. But compassion makes sense when you're dealing with another. When you're dealing with a relationship, the other, which means society, which means family, which means culture, which means the world. You may not eat because you'll say, oh, I want to be non-violent. I don't want to eat anything. I'll be the hermit. But what about the child who is hungry? Will you feed the child? Will you tell the child, no, 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 no. Eating is equal to violence. Let's be non-violent. Let's not eat. The child will keep crying. So the goddess. This goddess, her husband is a hermit. He sits on the mountain top, does nothing all day but meditate. And she is the princess who chose him as the husband. She chose him, he didn't choose her. And she realizes, well, he's very wise, but he's not very smart. <laughs> he can't do a day's job. He has no skills. He's very wise. So she calls him Bholenath, the innocent one. The fool, the gullible fool. She loves him. She doesn't begrudge him. She chose him. She says, he has the wisdom that I've not seen anywhere else in the world. But I have to compliment him. I have to build the house. I have to cook the food. I have to take care of the children. I have to manage the house. So, I, so he may say no sex, but listen, I want children, so I'm going to have sex with him. So she sits on top of him and says, give me babies, quickly. <laughs> and he comes with elaborate arguments that, you know, I, am, I will never die. I'm Swayambhu. I cannot have, I don't need children. She said, I'm not talking about you. I want children. I want children. Do you get it? Someone else other than you? <laughs> and she's, he's like, OK, do what you want. And that's how do you present this thought visually? She's on top. She dances on top of him. That's why she's, he's called Shava, the corpse without her. With her, he becomes Shiva. Shava means the corpse. You're dead, you're useless. Oh, you wise man sitting on top of the mountain, you're of no value to the world. Until you come down and participate, engage. So you become Shiva, come down, become from the mountain, come down to the mountain. Marry me. Again, metaphor for world engagement. So it's the opposite of the Buddhist traditions. She is therefore Tara. She is telling him to become the Bodhisattva. I'm using the Buddhist and Hindu narratives together so you, get a, you understand the what the idea is, the broad idea. She's 
forcing him to participate in the world and he's like okay this is as far as I can go not more so she takes care of the world she kills the demons she produces the food she does the protection she nourishes she's Annapurna the goddess of the kitchen she cooks food for a husband who doesn't eat because the husband is an ascetic he doesn't want to eat he's like I'm not hungry what does it matter and she's cooking food for whom she said you are not hungry but my children are hungry you are the wise one but what about the rest of the people who are hungry can I nourish them and she says yeah he says yes in fact he becomes bhikshatana he becomes the beggar he goes and asks food for her to feed them in other words she socializes him that's the modern language socializing he is withdrawn from the world she socializes him she makes him part of society and society is the world of sex and violence how much sex how much violence so the if you look at the chinna mastika image it's extremely in your face it's very difficult to handle this image there are no temples of this image there are only one or two temples but they are like abs far away because you can't show this to people this is a woman cutting her head off drinking her own blood dancing naked sitting on top of a man and copulating with him these are tantric visually images and you're like oh my god this is censored triple x can't show this to people <laughs> this is this is the truth we know it's the truth but it's the same reason we shut the toilet door when we go to the toilet we know it's the truth inside but oh, let's be true let's not have a toilet door no that's not happening You know, so there are the, you know, people have these romantic notions of we shall do everything. That's fine for you, not for me. I need my dough. You stink. <laughs> and we therefore create culture which distances itself from nature. Culture domesticates nature, cultivates nature, controls nature. And so the sexual imagery is subtle over here by showing her as a bride. It's just subtle, you get it. Not more than that. The why is she wearing cosmetics? When you make an offering to the goddess, you give her fabric, you give her jewelry, you give her cosmetics, you give kajal, coal, you give my mother used to give red colored ribbons for her to tie her hair. Or you give garlands called veni, garlands with which to tie the hair. Because the wild goddess, her hair is wild and open. You want her to be domesticated. How do you show domestication? tied hair hair is tied so you tie her hair you put the kajal you put fragrance you wear a red sari so you give when you go to a goddess temple there'll always be offerings of fabric why fabric because you can't stake that nature in its wild form is too much to handle we want her to be domesticated we want her to be gentle socialized so she herself is being socialized she who is socializing the hermit is herself being socialized and violence is shown not as violence but as defense it's not random violence for hunger to satisfying hunger it is defense defensive violence this is shown as defense so it's a modified version of the same image this people can handle this we can't handle this is too much this is meant for the acolyte this is meant for the the practitioner who wants to go deeper and it's like a academic who is going into the academic text everybody can't handle academia so give me the summary give me the movie version this is the movie version <laughs> simplified accessible i can access it i can access this image i see the woman coming home and she comes in this grand image with her this woman with eight arms and you're seeing avahan you're calling her you're giving her food you're giving her jewelry you're giving her everything that you give your daughter so now you're connecting with her using emotion you're connecting her so the language is not cognitive it is not intellectual the language is emotional bhava because lang i can communicate with you at three to four levels I can treat, uh, communicate it at the level of sensations, through sensations, which is rasa. I can communicate it with you through emotions, which is bhava. I can communicate with you intellectually, which is vijnana. 
I can communicate in so many different ways. I can communicate it with you through transaction, which is yagna. I can give and take. So, so many levels of communication. I don't have to restrict myself to giving and taking, giving you gift. I can communicate with you through love. I can communicate with just through feeling, just the touch. And all this, therefore the celebration, the singing and dancing at the festival, if you ask people why is she, if you ask, imagine a mother taking her child to the pandal and the child will look at the mother and say, why is she killing a buffalo? The mother will say, shut up. <laughs> Don't ask too many questions. I didn't ask my parents, you will not ask me. You will enjoy the food, you will sing and dance, you will enjoy the song, music, the pomp and ceremony of the Durga celebrations. Everything doesn't have to be intellectual. Enjoy the emotional rush that you get with it. Enjoy the, the, the sensations, the food that you're eating, the song that you're singing. It's a festival. And the festival will last for nine nights, after which the image will be dunked in the river. This image will be thrown into the waters, it will dissolve into the water. The goddess goes away, there is no trace of her. Like, you know, I'll tell you how. Take this, and then just tear it. How does it feel? This is called Visarjan. This is the end. Why is this important? Every year the goddess is brought in, and every year the goddess is thrown out. So she comes and she goes, she comes and she goes. Because nothing lasts forever. Nothing lasts forever. And so suddenly this Buddhist idea, two and a half thousand years old, is being shared without saying it. I'm not going to tell you that, you're going to experience it. Every year the goddess will come and every year the goddess will go. Every year she'll come, every year she'll go, every year the, she comes with her and every time I will look at her and every day I will, for ten days I will enjoy with her and at the end of ten days, I will let her go. She will go away back to her husband's house. And I'll go back to my regular life. And again I will worship her next autumn, and the autumn after that, and the autumn after that. And the only thing that is changing is the goddess image is not changing. I am growing older. I am growing older. I was a girl when I saw her, then I become a woman, I become a boy to a man, to an old man. And my child will see the same image. And his child will see the same image. The ritual will be constant. What is changing is you are changing. I have experientially communicated to you what Buddha cognitively speaks of. Nothing lasts forever. Desire is the cause of suffering. We want to frame that image, but it shall be destroyed. Everything has to end, the body has to be burnt. The ashes have to be thrown in the river. To quote someone at lunch said, you come for some time and you're fabulous for a moment and the show comes, comes to an end. That's life. The festival will not last forever. And suddenly you realize this is the thought which is being shared through story, symbol, ritual, drama, dance. These are all communication technologies. It's just they're not called that. You have to experience it. And therefore you let go easily. When the relationship is good, you enjoy it. And when the relationship is bad, you let go. Nothing lasts forever. Not even death. The body goes and comes back. The body needs to be nourished. What is destroying you is also creating you. So the Navaratri festival, Nine nights, and you wonder, oh my God, this is what is happening. We're talking about the cycle of life. At the same time, we're talking about things that come and go. We're talking about sex, we're talking about violence, we're talking about hunger, we're talking about fear, we're talking about culture, we're talking about nature, we're talking about men, we're talking about women. 
we are talking about sensations, we are talking about emotions, we are talking about intellect, transactions, society, life, so many things are happening in just this one image, all happening in this one image, it is just coming at you, but you can only receive a little bit of it which is fine, you do not need to know everything and if you do not know everything it is fine because you will never ever know everything. We will only know a little bit of life every time. Whenever I come to New York I say so many restaurants, some come and go and I said I should eat everywhere, you can't, even if you try, because by the time you are finished with all of them three more have appeared again in the corner <laughs> and two more have gone forever and they will always be, it will always happen, you know it, things come, things go, things change and observe how this idea is presented through story, symbol and ritual. I told, I began with sharing with you an image, then I told you about the ritual, then I told you the story, then I started decoding the story and I made it more cognitive and you suddenly start seeing patterns, structures, images and you come back to the ritual and you essentially experience life in all its wisdom. This I wisdom, part of it you will say he is Buddhist, it is Jain, it is Hindu, it is Puranic, it is Shakta Parampara, the goddess traditions, it is Vaishnav traditions, Vishnu traditions, Shaiva traditions, pick the school of thought you want. This are the way ideas are transmitted. Around the world ideas have been transmitted, not just in India, in every part of the world you will find something like this in different forms in tribal law, in poetry, because we are trying to share our understanding of the world and that is mythology. Mythology is the subjective truth of a people, how they see the world, they are sharing how they see the world through stories, symbols and rituals. If I do not have story, symbol, ritual I do not know how to transmit them, even if the idea is forgotten story, symbols and rituals will transmit themselves on their own, we transmit, therefore we do rituals even if we do not understand them we keep doing the rituals. You know, I am sure many of you all will still go to vote even if it does not make sense, <laughs> because you got to do what you got to do. Rituals design society and that is how it all functions, yeah and that is what Durga is all about, that is for me Navaratri, this is my understanding of the goddess traditions, hope you liked it, thank you. Yes, your question. This was actually earlier on, you had, you had said that you had to build something to get the wheel. Do you have to pull anything to make an Oreo? Yes, you do. <laughs> yes, you do. You just don't see it. Sorry. <laughs> so I'll come to you with the mic so that we can. Uh, my question is very simple, why 9? Why, nine? why not 8, why not 11? We would not know, really honestly the simple answer is we do not know, we can speculate. It is not a very clear answer has not been given, so you can come up with whatever answer you want. So I am sure there are people with answers already. Uh, 9 nights, why 9 nights? Uh, one of the reasons I read somewhere was that because the cultivation takes like nine days to kind of sprout out. See something. these are all these speculations, so for example you have uh, a reason, because there are many such reasons like that, you know one more reason is actually the festivals of 18 nights, 18 is an important number in India, Yes. you know 18 chapters of the Mahabharat, 18 chapters of the Gita, so 18 is important and they say they split it into two. Okay. 9 right. for spring and 9 for, so there were 18 nights and then they say Ra, in, when Ramayana took place Ram says that I want to worship the goddess in autumn, so he takes away 9 nights from the, uh, the, the spring festival and brings 9 nights into the autumn, oh, okay. so 9 plus 9, 18, so 18 is a, and why is 18 an important number nobody knows, <laughs> you know so there are these various number numerous co conversations that are there, we, we really do some that is somebody came up with the idea that you know 9 months of the year, for, you become pregnancy is 9 months, right. 
But you see, that is the solar calendar. That's not the lunar calendar. And traditionally, you calculate using the solar calendar cannot be measured in, uh, naturally, the lunar calendar. So we don't really know. Honestly, maybe people just like the number. Something that you explained, the Chinda Mastika. Yes. Uh, I've been trying to understand the concept of shivling. Would, shivling. You, would you be able to explain that in this? Sure, session? but that's a that's a lecture by itself. You'll sponsor my next trip. I'll come and teach you. But uh, you know, the simpler answer is fifteen dollars, seven secrets of Shiva, right out there. <laughs> See, I'm in the land of capitalism. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that is the first chapter. Only deals with that. Any other questions? I have a question, but I just want to say something. Sure. I read your Jaya first. Okay. And um, a few years back, and I was blown away. Uh, I'm okay. I think. No, 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 no. They're recording it. it. They're recording oh, okay. it. So. Um, I was blown away. Um, Thank you. Not only, um, I have read the Mahabharat growing up and uh, the Ramayana uh. and everything. But after reading your book, I thought, this is a book my daughter can read when she becomes like a teenager. She's growing up here in America uh, to explain to her uh, why, um, you know, when you say the story of Ramayana and you say, oh, Dasharath had so many wives. Why so many wives? You know, as a five year, <laughs> six year. So when I read Jaya, I thought, um, you know, it would uh, relate to a lot of people the way it was done. And I would definitely want to comment on your drawings. I love them. They, are, so <laughs> they are beautiful, the illustrations Thank that come you. in your Thank book. You. They are very, very good. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I have read a lot of your books. Like, uh, I started from Business Sutra, and then mm. I'm reading now My Gita. Uh, I think the My Gita is really a very nice book <laughs> that helps to, you know, uh, uh, solve some of the conflicts. Like, for example, if my wife says something and if I don't agree, I simply say, it's your Gita, this is my <laughs> Gita. <laughs> anyway. That's the first time I'm hearing this. So domestic <laughs> issues sorted out through My Gita. Yeah, so. <laughs> anyway, um, my question is, you explain about uh, the Devi Gurta, uh, Durga. And you said that the Devi uh, Durga was formed through the, uh, the female part of all, mm. all gods. Uh, but in one of the serials, uh, you know, uh, I, see, I, I, I see a lot of mythological serials. Mm. One of the serials was uh, Devi Durga, uh, Hema Malini was featuring into it. And the very first episode was shown like, you know, uh, to create a, a nature, mm. you know, like in Hindi, to. Uh, to generate or to uh, yes, yes. to create a prakruti, hmm. uh, you know, uh, Devi Durga created uh, okay. Shiva, and then they yes, yes, they I together know. generated the prakruti, yes. right? But with your story, like it's little conflicting to me. Yeah. Uh, could, could you explain how? You know, it's like vegetarian, non-vegetarian. What is the right way? If you start searching one way, then you miss the point of Hinduism. Hmm. If you go to uh, Vishveshna traditions, they will say that version is rubbish. It's a Himalayan Malini version, and therefore Bollywoodization, because yeah. she wants to be on top. Yeah. And the guy's stories are guys are on top. So Vishnu stories will be Vishnu is on top, and Shiva stories, Shiva is on top, and the goddess story, she is on top. So everybody wants to be on top. Good. Yeah, so ultimately they just stand next to each other. And each other is fighting so hard that they merge and become one. Mm -hmm. Because I think somewhere along the line, these are also political stories. Okay. So whoever is the priest telling the story wants his deity to be the supreme position. And what is the supreme position? Everything started from me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's how they think. So all the versions will, you have to always ask who is telling the story. Okay. So if, always ask who is the storyteller. Because that will reveal his intention. Where is he coming from? Why is he telling you the story? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if you don't see the gender of the storyteller, the socio-economic structure of the social, they will. Everybody brings their own politics into their story. That's natural. We all do that. So, if you read Devi Bhag, Devi Puran, which is goddess traditions, the goddess created the world. You read Vishnu Puran, Vishnu created the world. Correct. You read the Bible, Yahweh created the world. Which is the truth. <laughs> okay. You know? Okay. So ask the Pope, he will change, he'll tell you something else. <laughs>
So, uh, so just coming from a contemporary society and a yeah. global a globalization, how important is it for us to know all these stories? You see, globalization is trying, when we say inclusion, what we mean is can I include stories? Inclusion, exclusion is rejecting your stories. Violence is rejecting the story of the other. And what is happening today in the global village is that we're saying, well, there's one story that we all should agree with, which is why there's so much violence in the golden. Remember, just five years ago, everybody was talking about globalization. Now, today, we are talking about Donald Trump. This shift across the world, there is this right-wing movement, angry movements happening, because somewhere along the line, the intellectuals decided not to listen to the stories of the non-intellectuals saying that we in universities and parliaments will decide what the appropriate story is. And so across the world, there is an anti-intellectual trend. Mm. Because the intellectual became the snooty man who said, I will tell you what the truth is. He became the Brahmin, he became the priest, he became the shaman. He decided what the truth is. So it's not inclusive. We, the word you, inclusive is used in a very casual way. Across universities, Across, there are these clever ways of keeping out other stories. Across countries, there are barriers like visas which keep out stories. And not knowing other people's stories is where violence comes from, rage comes from, because I don't want to hear your story. I only want to hear a story which glamorizes me. Yeah, so these stories were always told. So this version that you said, if you stick to that one version, you will definitely have a fight with someone who has not watched that film. And then you wonder, why are we fighting? It's because you didn't see each other's stories. Empathy is not there. The, what is called gaze, G-A-Z-E. And we don't see how people see. And you're continue, in Indian storytelling, they'll always, the storyteller will always say, I heard this from so-and-so, and he heard it from so-and-so, and he heard it from so-and-so. What is he doing? He's de-risking himself. He's saying, I'm not telling you the truth, I'm telling you a Chinese whisper. And I may be wrong. He's protecting himself by saying, it's not, I'm not the primary source of the information, I'm the secondary or tertiary source of the information. So we should be, I think, multiple stories enables us to be empathetic. Question here. Go ahead. Hello. Hi. Yeah. So I actually read many of your books, like Sita, Ram, yeah. Business Sutra, Jaya, most of them. So I'm like very much in, uh, impressed by the detailing you have done. Like I being like uh, being born in Hindu, Hindu family, I knew all the rituals and I knew most of the things, but I didn't knew the detailing behind it. Thank you so much. Which you covered it very nicely and very brilliantly, I think. Thank you. Thank so I'm. This is not related related to this session, but uh, this is about like a uh, book which I read, which is Ram. So if like God had all the powers, right? So why did God have to go through all the sufferings and? Like, what would be the yeah. best message according so, to you? This is avatar. Avatar and God are two different things. God is infinite. Avatar is finite. If you have a male body, you have to function with a male body. If you have a female body, you have to function with a female body. If you have an animal body, you have to function with a animal body. So the rules cannot be changed once you enter the world of the finite. So even God has to suffer. But the question is, it's not about God has to suffer. God has to, let me rephrase this, will also have experiences that can cause suffering. But the difference between the divine and the non-divine is the divine has the, in, the wherewithal to deal with it. We don't. So divinity in India is only wisdom and also being smart. So Shiva is the wise God who is not smart. Vishnu is the smart god who is sometimes wise. And therefore you have both the de deities together and the god is saying that, okay, one of you will be my son and one of you will be my husband. And therefore sometimes she is married, Shiva is married to Shakti, but the goddess is always the responsibility of Vishnu. He has to come down and save her from problems because the kings are treating her badly. So this is, life is about that. Life is always going to be about these issues, fragmentations, things will come and go. You have to deal with it. 
the fragmented nature of our lives. We have to deal with the fragmented. And divinity is the unfragmented reality which take, becomes a fragment to teach us how to do it. So that's the whole point. Indra has everything, right? He has wish fulfilling tree, wish fulfilling cow, but he's a miserable, unhappy man. Because having doesn't make you happy. Shiva has nothing, but he's always happy. But the problem with Shiva is that he does not socialized. So then Vishnu comes into being, socialized, participating. But that doesn't mean he lives a happy life. Krishna comes, sings and dances with everybody and breaks everybody's heart. <laughs> Ram is a king who is helpless. So there's despair associated with Ram and there's heartbreak associated with Krishna. What do you want? Heartbreak, despair. Because if you have, somebody said, you know, I want a boyfriend like Krishna and a husband like Ram. <laughs> so I just said, oh, it means you want heartbreak and despair. <laughs> and then, so, oh, the Shiva is much better, you know, because Monday you worship Shiva, that I want a husband like Shiva because he does no work, you have to do all the work. But he's great because he'll do whatever you tell him to do. He's obedient. So these are the various formulas. None of the gods are perfect. If you look carefully, none of them are perfect. Each one has its... If you give these three gods, who do you select? And you're like, I'll live on my own, that's fine. <laughs> uh, the gentleman here, please. Hi. Uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, I've read the book, Siddharth, and I think I recently read your article about how his wife was eventually the person who had, who, I mean, she had the enlightenment more than him. I'm just trying to understand where this message of being a hermit and him finding, founding the whole religion based on his, on his time of being a hermit. I'm missing, like, I'm missing the point, whatever you explained today and what I read in the book seems to be conflicting. Read my book, you'll get it back later. <laughs> <laughs> No, I mean, in the book at least, like, he, he has to go through everything that a mortal being goes through. Which what book we talk are you talking about? Siddharth by Herman Hesse. Herman Hesse is not about the Buddha. It is about a man called Siddharth. Right. So, but, I mean, it's spoke, that's what I'm trying to understand. Is it about Buddhism or the whole, how the that's religion the, was founded? That story is or? about a man called Siddharth who encounters the Buddha in his life's travels. Which is a very small part of the book, but okay. And he has, he has sex, he gets married, he has things, and he's going through all the things. So after reading the book, you didn't get the point of the book? No. I, I mean, after reading the book, it was almost like you have to live life and Yeah, but that's the, the author's thing. view, no? That's not right. That that's so not the Buddha. That's not the Buddha. have a different view. You, are you seeking one answer? No, I'm not. From, I, was conf I, had, I had a conflict. Was it, how, was it Buddhism? Was it about Buddhism? Because the book didn't seem very You'll clear about... You'll have to talk about. to someone who knows that book. I'll come back to you. Thanks. Ah, the goddess Durga, Durga, as you said, this is basically in the eastern part of the India. And it is basically... Uh, in some articles I've read and uh, some way it is uh, depicted as... You know, the people who were originally in Indus Valley and they shifted to Jamuna Ganga and mm. then slowly moved to the eastern side. <laughs> so these people, maybe uh, fairer people, they had a conflict with the forest people, <laughs> the Adivasis. And uh, particularly in eastern India at that point of time, there was a, there was a I mean, it was full of buffaloes. <laughs> and these uh, buffaloes were killed, uh, the forests were cleaned, and there was conflict between the, yeah. uh, the fairer people and the dark uh, uh, originals or Adivasis, whatever you call. So this is depicted at the image of uh, Durga. Similarly, uh, when you mentioned about the Kali, they are also, it is, uh, uh, I have read somewhere, it's that uh, the goddess Kali uh, here, it is a compromised god in the sense that Kali is basically from the original inhabitants. Okay. Black skin and all that. And the Sh Shiva, which is lying below, uh, is a fairer skin, and it is just said that smeared with ash, so it is looking fairer. So he's, uh, the, the, the Kali is putting her 
feet, uh, foot on the uh, Shiva, and the tongue comes out. It is basically also looks like a compromised god. It's a conflict between the people who settle and conflict between the other people. That's what I That's one say. version, good version. Yeah, sure. I know where you're going, but resist, resist. <laughs> yeah, these views of conflict, religion as a conflict comes up uh, in Europe. I wrote a book on this, and this is, starts with Luther rebelling against uh, Catholicism. And so every religion is marked down to ethnicity and conflict. And from this comes the Holocaust, anti-Semitism, Aryan thesis, and I think we have to learn to let this go. <laughs> no, see, you see, uh, conflict always gets the scores in a TV show. So if you want to do a good TV show, you create conflict, so you like it. So. Hey David, thanks for the wonderful talk. Uh, so, in the image that you showed of uh, Devi, like, what's the significance of the color red? And like, sometimes when you offer the saris, hmm. sometimes the red saris offer, sometimes green, sometimes yellow. So, like, yes. what's, what's the significance? Well, of the um, colors? see, colors have meaning, but you have to also take it in context. But simple is that see, the earth before the rains is red in color, after the rains is green in color. So red has always this represent potential. What can happen? And green is what has happened. So the virgin is red. So Kumari, whenever you see the virgin, that means potential, red color is used. Whenever you will talk godmother, green color will be used because it's realized. So that's how they will use the color. Yellow is used, see it's the color of the sun. So in Haldi Kunku, when you're using Haldi Kunku, the first you'll use Haldi is to remove the negative energies. And then you'll introduce the potential, the red color is used. And then you'll use chawal, which is rice, grains of rice, the realization of that potential. So remove the negative energy, introduce the positive potential, and allow it to transform into a fruit, which is the rice, grain of rice. So yellow, red, white. In that case, white it will be green in some other places. So these, but of course, uh, remember these are not like one line which you can take everywhere. It varies with context. So red color, for example, has been the traditional symbol of India because the goddess is the symbol of the goddess. In one of the theories, is it is menstrual blood because it's symbol of life, it's a symbol of things. But now red has been taken away by the communists. <laughs> so you can't have red flags. So we use variations and say, okay, let's add yellow to it. And then orange and saffron comes along. <laughs> so, because you moment show red color, you think of some other culture. And you think of, because that's, language changes, right? Colors change. But if you go to uh, Banaras and all that, they still use red flags. It's the color of the goddess. I, I have one more. Uh, sure. So, you gave, I gave the uh, story and uh, symbols and rituals about how nature and Prakriti is. Is there, so we have our stories about rebirth, but is there a symbol or any ritual or something that signifies, okay, rebirth is a concept that's, you know, always See, all these about. festivals, uh, see, if you look at some of the most domestic festivals, like a Satyanara and Puja, there's nothing. Then you bring everything together, even a Yagna, nothing exists, then you'll create the altar, you'll invoke the divine, and then you will destroy the altar. This is rebirth. So traditionally, altars, this whole permanent structures, like temples, as permanent structures are a much later creation. Traditionally, worship has always been, even if you go to the villages, the temples, and nobody goes to those temples. And only on the festival day, they'll come. And it'll become these grand structures. On that day, it's divine. On every other, Kumbha Mela, you go to the same place. Once in 12 years, it becomes a sacred place. Everywhere it is not sacred, otherwise it's just there. So sacredness is also cyclical. It comes and goes, it's like your birthday. On that day, you're special and everybody will send you cards. Not every day. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, my question is not directly related to the lecture, but in general, uh, maybe you can call it physics. How does any religion, not just Hinduism, it could be Buddhism or any other religion, yeah. explain 
what's beyond Earth or what's in the universe? Do any of them explain? In Not any? really, because you see, the idea of the of a world beyond Earth starts appearing in human history only after the 16th and 17th century. No, but there Before were that, some like Aryabhat and all in the fourth century. We had clear images of Earth being round, uh, right? Like. Uh, if you look look at some text from the fourth century, uh, uh, where uh, as per the Hinduism text from Aryabhat, uh, where we knew that uh, Earth is round, for example. Yeah, but we didn't take it. See, these are many, many such ideas exist. We can speculate and impose anything anywhere. Okay. I haven't read anything, so maybe you have to ask someone else. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, if we compare uh, mythology from like Hindu mythology and um, such things from West, like Greek mythology, Roman, is do you find a peculiar striking similarity or something which is like peculiarly different between two so, kinds of philosophies? So all cultures will deal with hunger and fear because that's universal. Hunger and fear is universal. So any religion, any culture, will deal with hunger and fear, and therefore death, mortality. How they will deal with it will vary. So in Greek traditions, they spoke of you live only once. Most of us will live ordinary lives, mediocre lives. Some of us will become special. And if you become special, you'll get a special heaven called Elysium. That's it. The story ends after that. There is no second story. There's only one story. In the Indian subcontinent, they said, you live many lives, so why are you so bothered about this life? Not happy with this life? Next life, you'll be taller, smarter, better looking, <laughs> richer. <laughs> What's the hurry? Don't... So if you look at the, old, the, the one life concept, it celebrates ambition, achievement, objective. Let's get there. Let's go and do it. The Indian tradition will say, why? You know, so you have these two opposing schools. Now, which is the right way? It depends, right? When things are going good for you, you should say, I have to do things, I have to achieve things. When things are going terrible, you'll say, why? <laughs> so you pick and choose. Decide what you want. <laughs> <laughs> we are in postmodern era, so anything is possible. So you just take what you want. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, as you mentioned in your speech that uh, as a child growing up in a Hindu uh, household, you tend to have a lot of questions. And you ask your mom, your dad. Generally, they don't know the answer, but then they'll give you a roundabout answer, or they'll say that you know you, yeah. you'll not understand and things like that. Coming in touch with your works, your books, your articles, uh, it opened a whole new world uh, for me. And I'm pretty sure for a lot of people like me. So great thanks for that. Uh, one of the books or the article I read, uh, <clears throat> somebody asked you about your favorite quote from mythology. Mm -hmm. I, I don't remember the exact quote. It's about uh, Thousand Eyes. That's the line which I write at the beginning of all my books. Yeah. Uh, what exactly is the meaning? Because I'm trying to, uh, you and me only have one or you and me only have two eyes, Valuna has thousands. That means nobody sees everything. That's the meaning. Okay. That's all it means. Nobody sees everything. But uh, I mean, what's the first line of the quote? Who sees it all? Oh, who sees it? Okay. So it's there if you think about it. Yeah? Also? You can't. Right? Yeah. So, you, also can so you're always in a fractured universe. Right. Okay. So. Any other questions? That's a lot for a Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> thank you. So um, we do have um, the four books that Dev Dutt spoke about, and also there's vegan cookies and vegan snacks and tea, chai across the way. So please come and join us and, and talk to them a little bit in person, okay? Thank you all.